The internet is a big dumpster. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to raid me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got all the luck I need. I've got a pile of broken mirrors and I'm walking under ladders and I'm spilling tons of salt, but to me that doesn't matter because my skin and my gender and my orientation are the best things to have if you live in this nation. I recommend it highly. A penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree We do the show live every Wednesday Right here on Twitch Twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media also, uh, simulcasting to YouTube and Facebook, uh, same username, and it looks like there's even some people chatting in the YouTube chat, which is amazing. You can support this project by going to ecoplexmedia.com, click the support link at the top of the homepage, and uh, I don't know, follow your favorite link there and give me your fucking money. I'm Producer Dave, and you can find me on Grinder. And I am HK Perrin, and you can find me on the inventor line on U.S. patent number 12,095,717. Well, very good. Good for you. Good for you. Con- <laughs> congratulations on getting a patent. Yeah, it isn't for a Santa Claus detector or for walking through walls, is it? <laughs> nope, it's for email. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, almost, al- almost as useless. <laughs> uh, where else could people find you on the socials if they want to do? Uh, if you want to find me on social media, you can find me on Mastodon at hparen at port87.social. So, um, we've been... We've been covering this Andrew Gold asshole for a little while now, and um, we've been covering the trigonometry assholes for many, many years. Um, yep. So, of, of course, they did a show together, and of course, we're going to watch it. <laughs> so, I like the yep. thumbnail. I usually don't show the thumbnail, but uh, it says canceled for trans views again. So, is this our, was he recancelified? Can you get canceled more than once? I think so. It's canceled so. always canceled, right? I think it's, I think it's like, how many times are you willing to throw a fit like a child because somebody said you were bad? <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like the first cancellation didn't take, right? I don't think anybody knew who he was. I don't think he was platformed or privileged enough to have been canceled in the first place. <laughs> Is that like if you rip out a wisdom tooth and another one grows in its place? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh. Man, speaking of wisdom, aren't you glad that David Fuller guy retired? Remember Modern Wisdom? Remember this guy? <laughs> yep. <laughs> aren't you glad he fucking retired? <laughs> so I guess we're going to get right to it. This will be the third anti-Scientology fucking weirdo, essentially, that showed up on Trigonometry. First, we had Chris Shelton, famously uh, still angry at us for uh, covering that. Still very angry. Uh, <laughs> then we had uh, that Aaron Smith-Levin guy went on uh, Trigonometry, and now we got Andrew Gold. Wait, did Aaron Smith Levin go on? I fucking forget. I, I, I stopped keeping track of those freaks, actually. Um, no longer covering those that freak show. I just don't have the energy. Anyway, let's, let's get started. Let's see what kind of bullshit's going on here. You've gone and got yourself cancelled, mate. Yeah, mm. again. Again. Double cancelled. Double yeah. cancelled. 
but it does seem to be gender. Isn't it amazing that like the people that always claim to be canceled are always like on such enormous platforms, just shouting from the rooftops that they're canceled. Also, he should get a um a jacket that fits. Uh, that gets you cancelled. Islam gets you killed. How did they find out that you have? He's been look. He's been wearing the same jacket since he was fourteen. Okay, yeah, I was going to say he looks like a little boy <laughs> who grew out of his jacket. <laughs> it's just the, 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 this is. The, <laughs> I have very real discussions with my wife about you know, are, are we are we safe and are we safe in the UK? Can you imagine? knowing there were people calling for the death of you and your family and they live down the road from you. Andrew Goldwyn. I mean, isn't that what these guys are doing to trans people? Or yeah, they, they like, it's, it's weird, right? I don't know if anybody's calling for that. I don't think this guy, I don't think this guy's like well known enough for, I mean, this guy personally might not be, but the people that they proselytize to are calling for the death of trans people. Cause it was very recent. We don't normally bring people back this often, but a, you're doing really well. It's good to see another British YouTuber do. Wait, I thought you were. Be I thought he was cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can just tell from the look. You know, it it it, it kind of adds another bag under your eye. That's that's what cancellation really means. <laughs> oh, so it's like being a parent or something. Yeah, it's just oh, I've been cancelled again. Cancelled, mate. Yeah, mm. again, again, double cancelled, double yeah. cancelled. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. No, it's great to have you back. Uh, so, <laughs> exactly, what does he mean by cancelled? Did he get kicked off Twitter? Because that would actually be like no. impressive. No, he didn't get nothing happened. Nothing happened. I don't think anything happened. I don't know. Oh, so not cancelled is what I, he is. I have not been keeping super good track of this guy anymore. Did someone just hurt his fifis? I hope so. So the book, yeah, The Psychology of Secrets, it's about authoritarianism and suppression and how governments and uh, authoritarian... Who just, who called him the new John Ronson? You know who John Ronson is? He's the mm -hmm. guy, he's the guy who did that, that famous Bohemian Grove infiltration with Alex Jones and their uh, takes on okay. what was going on at Bohemian Grove were uh, quite different. Also, like, truly edgy is the other, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the other little snippet here. Is that a compliment? I feel like that's like, yeah, isn't that derisive? I don't know. Regimes and things suppress their people. Um, also just about the sort of more of a microcosm of secrets themselves, what it is to keep them, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, before- Like that time that he didn't keep secret the correspondence that he had with a man who just died and instead read all his text messages with the man who just died on his, uh, on his live stream. That kind of, that kind of, those kind of secrets. Even and then made speculations, right? Yes. All different kinds of events, book festivals, bookshops, those kinds of things. Uh, bookshops will do signings and that. And promptly, a week or so later, disinvited from them all. Um, I haven't been given all of the information except for one or two that, that I know did cancel me. There was an event at the Tate. I don't know if it was the Tate, the organizers themselves, or the event makers who made the event there. Uh, the, a festival called Hayward Festival or something. And it's a really difficult thing here because I don't like picking on individual festivals and things like that. A lot of them don't have any money, as we know at the moment recently. They don't have Okay, so we've gone from, you know, complete ostracization from society means you're canceled to now you have a book signing and they cancel your book signing and now you yourself are canceled. Right, they like they like look at your YouTube channel and are like, oh, yikes, and then say, ah, we don't want to have your event here. Yeah, and then you get to go on, you know, one of the biggest YouTube channels in the right-wing ecosphere. Things like that. And complain about it. For them. At the same time, unless we do start to show them that it's worse for them, because they only care about popularity, that it's actually worse for them when they cancel because they're worried about controversy, uh, they're going to keep doing it. Anyway, so that's what happened. But, but what, why, why was that happening? What that book seems uncontroversial to me. Yeah, there's nothing controversial. Seems, did you read it? Except for a chapter about um, what we call PDF files on YouTube. There, there is a chapter of the, these people keeping a secret. The people who go to parks and uh, try to get children. Um, you can't say that word on YouTube, which is also ridiculous. Can you not? If you want me to, I can. No, no. But I, does that get demonetized? Yeah, sometimes. Particularly in the first few What minutes. if you call them nonces? Uh, I think that's all right because Americans probably don't yes. think yeah. of that. 
Although Joey Barton got in trouble for, for talking about bike nonces, didn't he? Well, like yeah. he called someone specifically a bike nonce and then had to say that he doesn't actually form <laughs> formally think that that person <laughs> likes children. Which, which I thought was weird because everyone knows that a bike nonce <laughs> doesn't mean that he's actually a nonce. It just yeah. means he's obsessed with bikes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. what does nonce mean in this context? It's a bad, bad child abuser. Why? It's that's just I don't know, dude. I don't make the UK slang. What do you mean? Why? What do you mean? Why? That's <laughs> that's UK slang. HK. Like nonce to me. I mean, well, as a, that don't, doesn't matter what it means. To programmer you. That's what it nonce means, in, means something completely different. But that's what like, it means. Why? It's a, HK. I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about the etymology oh, okay. of the word nonce. Um, it, it, in the UK, okay. it means a child abuser. Okay. Relations with a bike. Just a weird. How do you do that? Well, you have to ask for a bike's consent. Yeah, there's quite a lot of sort of phallic endings of the bike. Not that I've, I'm an expert on that. Right. Are they making rape jokes? I don't think so. Anyway, no. That's chapter ten. The, 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 the chapter ten about. Not I mean, they're making fun of like. There's nothing up there. Asking consent, right? From a from a bike, HK. From a bike. Yeah, but that's a rape joke. If you say so, I I I, I don't agree. They're going to say a lot of dumb stuff here. I don't feel like we need to reach that far out. To okay. Times that trans women are obviously, obviously, very obviously not women, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I mean, everyone knows that. A child knows that. Ninety-five percent of the population know that. The other five percent sort of know it, but are being tricked into thinking they. Where are you getting these statistics from? Yeah, like I feel like the majority of trans people, he he would say, are the gender that they're trying. To, well, I don't know about the majority, but like, you know, there there is this concept of passing when it comes to to trans people, and if you pass, quote unquote, as a trans person, that essentially means that a cis person like this asshole would not be able to tell that you are trans; would just assume that you're cis. So, like, I feel like, uh, do you know what the two pay fallacy is? No. You know, I can always recognize a toupee. Oh. It's like, well, what about all the toupees that you see that you can't recognize? Oh, so it's you like just a, don't know about them. It's like a it's like a selection bias for the times that you were right. Yep. So I feel like this that's what this guy's doing right here. He's just saying, like, oh, everyone can tell a, a trans person. And it's like first of all, no. And second of all, even if you can tell that a trans person is trans, it doesn't mean that they're not the gender that they say they are. Well, that, and the more important thing here is he just said that 95% of people like hold his view. And I think that that's not yeah. true. Yeah, that's not true in the slightest. He said children hold his view. And it's like children don't understand gender. And they, they probably haven't, uh, depending on how young they are, they probably haven't even thought about this that much, honestly. Yeah, like gender is not something that you're born with an innate understanding of. You have to be taught. And that is where the issue lies. I thought it might be more to do with Islam, but I've been told because I've been saying I'm worried about and concerned about some of the aspects of Islam, but it does seem to be gender that gets you cancelled. Islam gets you killed. But I haven't. So are you cancelled and dead? Of course, I've been cancelled. Right. <laughs> so that's really interesting still because we talk all the time on this show, and people make the point that things are getting better, that we are starting to move beyond peak woke, as it's often called. Do you think we have, or is this an example that we haven't, and this stuff is still in the water? It's something that's really hard to empirically know, isn't it? Is it getting better, or are we starting to surround ourselves with viewers and other collaborators who are all, all like-minded in this respect, so it seems better to us? It's really, really hard to know. What I would say about bookshops in particular, festivals in particular, that these are festivals. particularly woke places. What, is he a DJ? Like, is he in a band? What is it? Festival? Sounds sounds great. Sounds great. I would love to go to a festival and listen to some asshole fucking pontificate <laughs> to me about like somebody else's gender. Sounds like a great time when you're on Molly. I mean, it sounds like the festival that this guy was kicked out of is actually pretty cool. Well, and it could be like more like a conference. Maybe, you know what I'm saying? Like, again, there's like different sort of ways they talk about things in different parts of the world. So maybe, you know, like they, they have this, this thing, the Aspen Ideas Festival, which is just literally, it's just a <laughs> conference they, where they, where they, where a bunch of like people who think they're really smart talk. 
But when I, think I mean, of as long festival, as this guy's not invited, it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> when I think of a festival, I think of like music and a party. Yep. <laughs> the last bastions of the wokeness. So if it is uh, starting to get a little bit better, that's the last place. Universities, of course, as well. It's the academics. It's the type of person who is happy to work for a relatively low wage, providing they can uh, try and tell everybody else what to do. I think. <laughs> you know, I don't mean that of all bookshop people. Yeah. All, I mean, a lot of them are just wonderful people who want us to read more books. Of course they are. And a lot of them are, are really good people who understand all of the, the nuances. But unfortunately, they're going to get protested. So they're in a difficult spot as well. How did they find out that you have these horrendous opinions? I mean, if you go to my YouTube, it's just, the, 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 this is the, <laughs> <laughs> Trans women aren't women, women is like the banner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, Please don't take our slogan. Yeah, <laughs> I think I did see that. It was a Kelly J. Keene, it was like that. I thought, well, that's got over a million. So let's just yeah. keep saying it. Yeah. This is a problem that we have as well as, as creators, uh, yeah. particularly on YouTube. The algorithm is changing all the time. We have to make a living. We have these extremely expensive uh, productions because we want to be able to compete just as a few of us against huge TV channels like the BBC to give an alternative or an alternative, a different view. Um, this doesn't seem like an expensive production. I think there's like three cameras and some lapel mics and maybe like a video editor. It's a lot of money. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. So then you put out a video and you go, okay, I'm going to give it a more nuanced thing. Hey, maybe trans women are not women. We should talk about it or something like that. And it will get like, as you guys know, that it will get one tenth of the number of views, mm -hmm. which means you can't then afford to run the channel, which puts the videos out there with more nuanced views that convince people. So you're in this difficult trap that I'm sure you guys can relate to, right? You, you, you feel that way sometimes or not? Um, I don't know. I, I feel that w we've tried to thread the, I mean I think you're right mm. that, that you're always thinking how do we have a title and a thumbnail that make gets people interested on the one hand but also how, to, how for us being faithful to the content mm. is quite important right so you, that is a balance balancing act I suppose uh, but you, I, I feel like I also feel that it depends on who you think your audience are I think there are some audiences that are much more likely to go for super clickbaity things. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure somebody can go through our channel and out of the 500 interviews we've done, pick out 10 and they say, oh, look, look at this clickbait. Generally speaking, though, I think we try to be a bit more sensible about it, which I think you do as well, in fairness. Wait, um, what? They just, sh they, a few minutes ago, they showed all the, the, the thumbnails on his thing. It's like his titles are as inflammatory as possible. Mm -hmm. However, these people went to your YouTube channel. It's like specifically trying to offend. That may have suggested that trans women are not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> they saw some of it and they saw some of it that was quite, quite, quite intense and extreme. I think it's, there's, there's a difference that a lot of people don't realize between clickbait and sensationalism. And mm. clickbait being, as you say, something that isn't actually there. Well, YouTube protects against that. You know, if someone say, oh, that's the thing that's there, you click on it and it's not actually there, you won't watch much of it and it means that you should won't share that video around. Uh, it has to actually be there. But if you take, let's say you do an episode with Matt Goodwin or someone like that. Does he not know how YouTube works? Well, he said it. Well, I don't know. We don't, we don't necessarily know exactly how it works, but like the, it, yeah, the, there's no, there's no, um, algorithmic thing checking to make sure that the thing in your title is in the video but <laughs> yeah like there is so much clickbait on youtube yeah and the other thing is like even if the thing that you the title says isn't in there in so many words but the maybe the overall message is there the people that that message is trying to reach are going to stick around for more of the video or if the video is just interesting enough to watch right it's in there and it was aggressive and he was right. You think he's right. There's nothing wrong with what he said, but that's the title. And then someone who doesn't know you and doesn't watch the entire nuanced conversation mm -hmm. sees just that. Trans women are women. This is the end of civilization. Those kinds of things, which do seem a, a, a lot more sensationalist than our shows actually are. Mm. And that's an issue with YouTube. It's an issue with the platforms. It doesn't seem sensationalist. It seems ridiculous. Like it is worth ridicule to say that this is the end of civiliz civilization. Right. And like, not for nothing, like, it seems like he wants to live in both worlds in some ways where he wants to live in this like sort of YouTube sensationalism world where he does, does and says like the most like outrage or maybe the titles or whatever in the, the thumbnail are as outrageous and provocative as possible. But then he also wants to live in like the prim and proper uh, book signing world. And it, mm. I don't think that unless you're like mega famous, which he's not. 
And I would I'd suggest that, you know, the trigonometry guys are getting closer to that, but they're not there either. Unless you're mega famous, you can't actually live in both of those worlds at the same time. No. BC, for example, don't necessarily have to contend with. A lot of the legacy media don't have to, so they'll look down on us and they don't realize that's a luxury belief in many respects. And I've had this argument with a lot of legacy celebrities who say, oh, I just wish your titles weren't so good. And it's like, mate, you got in through a gatekeeper while it was okay to be a white man going for jobs. <laughs> Wait, what? You don't have to worry about the title. Is of it, the show. You don't even know is it not you're okay to be a white man anymore? 60 quid a year. Can't look for a job. <laughs> Fuck, man, that's news to me. <laughs> not a bad idea. <laughs> And yeah. it's also as well, it's ignoring, if you look at any type of newspaper, they always had sensationalist headlines. That's true. So I find it deeply hypocritical when you have these publications pointing the finger at us and going, mate, you're the sun. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what? what Francis is saying is we're no worse than the Daily Star. Right, exactly. Right? And I get yes, you, you are. Put little stars on the nipples. Anyway. We, well, no, like like they're, 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 they might not be worse than like maybe the National Enquirer. That's what the Daily Star is. Oh, okay. I was unfamiliar. The <laughs> but yeah, like saying that is like, I'm not worse than a literal pile of shit. Yeah. It's like, okay, are, cool. But, but the, the Daily Star is a tabloid. Yeah. So. Yeah. Literal pile of shit. People at other podcasters, you get a lot of the centrist kind of smuggy podcasters mm. de decoding the gurus. That's one of them. They've, they've had a go at you guys. They've had a go at me. Have they had a go at you? I think they just don't. Was it just me. you? Yeah, yeah. Just me, man. yeah. So it should be. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, friends of the show, by the way, Chris was an interview guest of mine uh, from Decoding the Gurus. Uh, they didn't really have. They do. They do. It's exactly what the show says. They like there. It's like a, a psychologist and anthropologist who look at this type of content and talk about it through the lens of psychology and cultural anthropology. They're not really having a go at these people and they're not centrists either. They're liberals. This is dumb. Yeah. Jews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually true because they've had a go at me yeah, now. Yeah. Hmm. Well, they've had a go at us and literally in the middle of having a go at me for saying things like, look, if you like this content, Please do subscribe. They were doing a whole thing. Oh, typical grift. And as <laughs> as the sentence was, well, they, asked, they asked him to subscribe. Yeah. That is grift. That is not what they did. Yeah. As the, as that conversation was happening, it started to go towards mute on their on their audio podcast. It started to simmer down the audio, or whatever. And then said, "If you want the rest of us, please subscribe to our Patreon." I thought, how can you not realize the hypocrisy here? That they are literally in the middle of their sentence, cutting off the viewers. That's the respect they have for their listeners. Mm. While we're just saying, "Hey, subscribe for free," or if you like it, if you want extra stuff, do come along. I don't know. There's a smarmy smugness in the center. There's a smarmy smugness in the on the uh, on, on the TV and and of course bookshops, festivals, and things. And to get back to your question, yeah, they saw that stuff. They saw what I'd written, uh, what I'd had in the thumbnails and titles and things. They didn't watch the shows, obviously. I imagine, and they got in touch with Pan Macmillan, who was the, um, the 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 publisher, and Pan Macmillan said, "Sorry, they've they've disinvited you." But and here's the thing that I find really upsetting about this: their book festivals. If you look at some of the greatest writers in history, they tend to be quite problematic people. Mm. They don't tend to be very particularly well balanced. They don't tend to be nice on occasions. Charles Dickens was a bit of a C word. Mm. And what, so now how, how are we going to make something that celebrates an art form? Art forms are created by artists who very frequently, like I said, are not the best people morally. Yeah. You got, how is this going to work? Yeah. And, it and, doesn't. And then what does mor then you have to get into what does morally even mean? Um, I, I noticed, for, okay, so with regards to my book about secrets, secrets, we think we tell our secrets to people who are polite. It turns out that actually polite people are the, the, the people we're least likely to reveal secrets to. Mm -hmm. And that's because polite people uh, in any regime would have been the card-carrying members. All polite Wait, really means is uh, adhering strictly to a societal norm of a particular time and place. Anyone who's too keen to do that is not someone you would want to tell your secrets to, because if you did that in the Stasi, you'd be out. You know, mm -hmm. you'd be tortured and all of that stuff. So we know we've got it inherent within us, which is amazing, what? really, that we shouldn't tell secrets to polite people. We tell secrets to assertive people, people who are going to get stuff done without necessarily judging you. So what does it even mean? I think people tell secrets to people they trust, regardless of that person's perceived disposition, right? Like, yeah, like I don't, I don't, whether or not somebody's polite has little bearing on whether or not I would tell them something in confidence. I mean, I guess if they're polite and nice and whatever, I'm probably more likely to be their friend in the first place. I know some, I know some pretty abrasive people who I'm friends with too, who I would trust with information that maybe that I don't want them to reveal. Also, what does he mean by like telling people your secrets? 
Like, no, where's I mean, he going just, with this? I mean, it's just any information you don't want them to divulge to someone else. mean to be a polite person in particular what does it mean to live by the rules of the book publishing world for them to even set those kinds of rules like this is the narrow overton window of books that we accept and beliefs we accept suggests to me an author an authoritarian streak and why do we uh, you know you know i don't know maybe it's just me but like whenever i've had a secret i've always wanted to tell it to somebody <laughs> Why do we do that? Yeah, that will be, well, a lot of theories. But All right, so don't tell your secrets to Constantine. <laughs> right, no shit, right? He's <laughs> like, I know a secret. Oh shit, I got to tell somebody immediately. <laughs> right, that's the, I love all that stuff. I love thinking about the tribes mm -hmm. and why we do things. Um, so a tribe that had people in it who had this physical compulsion to reveal their secrets might have done better and and lived and passed on all their mm. genes within it. If you knew where some food was, but you tried to keep it for yourself and you didn't feel compelled to tell everybody else in the tribe, that tribe cohesion isn't going to be very good. You won't do well. So over millions or hundreds of thousands of years, the, the tribes who had this secret telling thing, and we call it the fever model. That's what the, well, they, I don't call it anything. That's what the sort of scientists mm. people call it. The fever model, very much like a fever in real life, in, which makes the body uninhabitable for the virus, your body starts to feel that way while you're keeping a secret, which is why you have such visceral uh, portrayals of it in literature, uh, the telltale heart, uh, crime and punishment, those kinds of people start to, almost as if they have a flu of some kind, they're, they're dying until they can get their secret out and feel better. But it's not always a good idea because the social consequences might be dire and you might be ostracized. So it's about weighing that up. And it's also as well, it's, Everybody knows what the rules are, but n they're not written down anywhere. Yeah. Because when, when we were... Well, then, no. I mean, everybody has different interpretations of whatever the rules must be if they're not expressed. People may come to, like, some kind of consensus on, like, you know, maybe nobody... Like, if, if you have a dinner party, you're not going to send people a list of rules, like, for what they can do at your house. But, you know, we, we have a general idea of how you would behave at HK's dinner party. Which, by the way, you can probably while out a little at HK's dinner party. No problem, friends. Well, no problem. One you're... of the unspoken rules that I would hope uh, people would, you know, assume is don't shit on the floor. Right. There's a toilet. And yeah, if you if you shit on the floor, that's yeah, you you are breaking one of those, you know, unspoken rules that I guess we all know. In but fact, I don't know, a bunch of conservatives broke into the Capitol and shit on the floor. But in so. fact, if you're going to a dinner party, maybe you drop the deuce at home before you go to the dinner party anyway. You have a better dinner party. <laughs> we work in the comedy industry. I remember this comedian came up to me and she was like, well, you, you, oh, there's no evidence that him or uh, Constantine ever really worked in uh, the London comedy scene. That there's things you're not allowed to say. What aren't you allowed to say? And I just went one, two, three, four, five. And then she stopped and just walked, past, walked the other way. Because we all know what the what the rules are, but it's very interesting because you go, how did they become the rules, mm -hmm. and n how are they enforced? Because they're not usually from like minorities being oppressed for decades. Well, they become and, like fighting for their rights. Well, that's generally how they become the rules. I think what he's talking like, that's about that's why you don't use the f word to refer to a gay person. So I think what he's talking about is social norms, and they just become the they just become the rules by society like ostracizing you if you break those social norms that's that's yeah but like rules. you know back in the i don't know 60s 70s like it would be perfectly fine to you know perfectly fine quote unquote in polite society quote unquote to refer to a gay person as the f word or you know a black person as the n word and probably a little further back than that but uh, yeah, like those things became taboo because of minorities fighting for their rights, fighting for equal treatment. So yeah, that's essentially where the unspoken rules come from is like, don't shit all over minorities who have fought for their rights for decades. But you know, these guys don't care about that. Well, they, they just want to, they just want to use slurs. I, they obviously do. They obviously do because they don't, they don't engage in that behavior. Do they just sort of, they sort of soft pedal the idea that maybe you should be able to, if you want. 
uh, they're enforced covertly. Yeah, uh, and it's insidiously done, or, or, as you guys know, often in the universities, it's young people changing to these fashionable words. Um, I find it amazing, you know, for a long time, you weren't allowed to say coloured. That was the one thing you're not supposed to say. And it was funny in England uh, for us or for, for the crowd to laugh whenever there was like an old football commentator who didn't seem to get the memo. And it was like 20 years too late. And were we really laughing at them because, or, or pointing at them because we thought they were racist because they used the word coloured? Did we really think that when the context was, he's a wonderful person, this coloured person, or, or, or he's doing good things for the coloured, or whatever it might be, uh, the intent was always good. However, this is somebody who wasn't au fait with the latest uh, words. Well, that that kind of sucks for that person as they age that they didn't have like a person that got, kind of pulled them aside and was hey, like, hey, dude, hey, dude, hey, dude, you're on TV. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we should uh, maybe we should talk about this in a different way. Oh, and that was funny to the rest of us because it meant we grew in status by comparison. About three or four years ago, we finally got a point to a point where I think everybody in the UK probably in America, knew. Finally, everyone, everyone's grandma, grandpa knew you're not supposed to say coloured. And then it changed from black to of colour. It went back to of colour again. So it seems like there were people... Well, no, that a person of colour generally means a non, non-white person. We still use the word black. Messing with us, trying to catch us out, trying to use the new words, and this is a very cultish thing to do as well—to start changing words and making sure everybody uses the right words. We no, 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 no. Oh, he always does this. He always kind of refers back to Scientology, but in the dumbest way. Like a cult or a control group will control your language by making you talk about things in certain ways that are sort of outside of the norm in a lot of cases, and um, that's very different than just sort of like the 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 you know the way you talk in polite company which is maybe different than the way you talk at a bar and whatever like this guy probably really hates the idea of code switching no so what he's describing is literally just the natural progression of language yeah yeah the, the language so always, I, like, language has always changed yeah i feel like he just doesn't like language or he doesn't like time maybe he's not a fan of time or language the time, the neurolinguistic programming, which just means they all changed their names. Everyone had different names. Again, much like the trans stuff, the she, he, uh, Zier, and the other, all the weird pronouns that they have. This has been done by so many cults. Are she and he uh, it's, weird it's, pronouns? It's, it's also like, he. is that weird? It's also, he's comparing the idea of like, is there, and it's not, most cults don't actually do this because it's like stupid and people don't like it and you're going to have a hard time recruiting, but there are cults where they, they, they've made you take you have to take on like a new name, like at least within the context of the, the controller demand group. But that's usually in, imposed upon you uh, by the controller demand group, not, not of like your own free will, where people change their name all the time. People change their last name when they yep. get married sometimes. Um, some people just change their name because they don't like their name. And that's their, their fucking business, you know? Yep. And imagine being such an asshole that like you refuse to use their new name. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of work, really. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> yep. it's, and if you knew somebody for a while is a different name, you're going to get it wrong sometimes and whatever. They're, they're, if, you, if you know, if, if there's somebody you know, somebody in your social circle, that shit just works itself out. It's usually fine. It feels new to those cult people who are making up the rules for the rest of us. And it, when we talk about cults, which I think is a fair comparison, we always, I always think of cults as people who operate on the extremes, people who have decided to move away from mainstream society, like the Heaven's Gate cult and all the other ones. But this is mainstream. This is right here. Can a cult be mainstream? Yeah, it depends how you look at cults. And a lot of the people, like in any industry, let's call it, the people who talk about cults, they like to gatekeep what a cult is. So they say, that is a cult, that is not a cult. And and they will say it's, it's uh, irresponsible to suggest there's any cultishness anywhere else. That's palpably untrue. Uh, the elements of cultishness are written into our DNA. That's who we are as humans. We are cultish. Every single one of us in some ways acts in cultish ways. It doesn't mean that we're a 10 out of 10 cult like Heaven's Gate or Jonestown or Scientology or Waco or any of those. But I, I, you can even see how like a, a book club, you go to a book club, um, that's going to be culty because in the book club, maybe you feel like there are certain things you can't say about the book you've just read. Maybe those are the only friends you have and you feel like if you say the wrong thing, you're going to be ostracized, you're going to be kicked out. So it's I don't think any, I mean, what, what kind of literary criticism are we talking here? Are you, are you going to be like, Hey, you know, you know, the, the, like, like, um, in uh, catcher in the rye, there was all this stuff about like the, 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 
the guy in the fish tank, right? There was all this, oh, it's symbolism, it's symbolism, it's symbolism. And if you just say, what if that's just a dude in a fish tank and the, the, the person who's, whose eyes we're seeing through in the book is like strangely obsessed with the dude in the fish tank and that's all that's happening here. They're going to be like, get out of the book club. <laughs> right? <I'm> like, no. <laughs> no. Somebody there might explain, be like, well, here's what, what, you know, other people believe the symbolism here is here. And so you might learn something and you might be like, oh, I'm still not buying it, but thanks. And thanks for not kicking me out of your book club. <laughs> <laughs> like, yo, dude, like, what do you mean? Like, ah. Uh, it's tribal in that sense. There might not necessarily be a leader as there is in cults. Uh, David Miscavige of Scientology, for example. So I, I do think that we are always going to be a little bit cultish that, Political ideologies, of course, are, and they're using the same tricks. So, of course, it can be mainstream, and then you can say the average person hasn't signed up to the trans cult to a, to a 10 out of 10 degree, but some of them might be a 3 or a 4. There are little things where they think, oh, I shouldn't say the wrong thing. Their friends will kick them out, and to me, that is cult-ish. Mm. So coming Wait, back it's, to your... it's cultish to not want your friends to think you're an asshole? It's cultish to respect people, Dave. Like, I respect you. That's cultish. Your publisher gets this email. You've been on a, a distance. I assume you respect me, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> what's up with this, this shot, right? Is Constantine in heaven? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Back to your story then. Your publisher gets this email. You've been on a, a disinvited or whatever the term is. Yeah. Uh, did you try to contest it or make a big stink about it or whatever? Like, there's obviously different ways you can go in that situation. I felt terrible. That's, that's the first thing to say. And I, oh yeah exactly <laughs> exactly there's some people said because i wrote this article on subset you're saying some people some sort of woke people were going oh i thought we weren't supposed to care about feelings i was like well that's a fundamental misunderstanding of how this works you're supposed <laughs> to have facts and then any good writer hopefully imbues those facts or shows the consequences of those facts which are the feelings yeah. but the facts still have to be there you can't build your house on shaky ground which is just the feelings right anyway that's too complicated for that particular <laughs> anonymous <laughs> troll who, I've, who i didn't give a second thought to and i'm still talking about two days later <laughs> Um, what was the question? What were we talking about? The question was, did you, what was your reaction? Yes. How did you try to deal with it? Francis called me um, and was really, really nice. I mean, that, that, that tells you you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know you've, you've, you've messed up. <laughs> when you get the Francis call in the industry, <laughs> you're out. Um, Francis called and said, if, look, if you, you know, it's a horrible feeling. And he, he, he empathized and it helped me a lot. And he said, uh, you've just been thrown out to the savannah. You know, you're out on your own because of, and, and you should know that you've got this community around you. And it was, it was such a beautiful thing to do. So thank you, Francis. That was the initial thing, but, it, but we happened to be messaging just as I got. Wait a minute. Isn't that what a cult does? That is. Yeah. Right. They're like, oh, you've been, you know, like, for example, like, um, and they mentioned Scientology, like a person I know that I no longer know who joined Scientology, her mother died. And they, they told her, oh, well, you have this community of people around you. And don't listen to that silly psychologist or psychiatrist who thinks maybe you should nope. get some therapy. You have this community around you. This is very funny that they were just talking about like cultish and cult behavior. And he's now talking about how the trigonometry guy is, do, is doing some form of parasocial love bombing with him. Yep, preying on the weak and disaffected. Uh, pit of your stomach, horrible, horrible feeling. And then there's, there's, there's embarrassment. Because again, if you're in the tribe and you've been caught, say, doing something that you're not supposed to do, stealing some of the food, taking the shelter, whatever it is, uh, again, your body primes you to feel embarrassment and shame so that you don't repeat those kinds of things so you stand a better chance of staying in the tribe. Well, as Francis said, I'd been kicked out that tribe. It felt awful pit of my stomach kind of thing and you don't want to rock the book the, the thing is he was the, the tribe he's talking about is like a like a book thing and he hadn't written a book before so it wasn't really part of that tribe to begin with because he just wrote his first book is he part of like the the, the bookstore signing tribe i guess he joined it real quick yeah i guess so just based on the invitation alone book's about to come out, first book ever. It's a big publisher, Pan Macmillan, and the individuals working there are really nice people. That's, that's the nuanced thing. And maybe it's not what people want to hear. They want to hear like, everyone's horrible and everyone's this. People are very complex, and a lot of them are really, really nice people who are trying to do their job. And I felt bad that I've made these PR people have a more difficult job than they would otherwise have had with a typical writer. As the days went by and the weeks went by, I started to feel a bit pissed off, especially receiving messages um, through people, and I don't want to say who the people are because they're just the messengers, but from the, the big wigs at Pam McMillan saying, don't share this on social media. 
and it's going to make things worse, that kind of thing. Well, as you guys know my story, I had about seven years uh, with the DEI stuff mm -hmm. where I was told you can't have this job because you're a white man. Uh, oh, that's right. He kept trying to pitch. So the, the backstory here is he kept trying to pitch this documentary to the BBC. They didn't buy his documentary. And um, he's he's claiming that they told him it's because he white. I'm thinking, you know, like the BBC, like they don't put out a lot of documentaries like in any given year. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not like they're, it's not like they're Netflix where they just pick up any old fucking thing. Like the BBC has limited like airtime. And so they didn't pick up any of his documentaries. Like, I don't know about this. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the criticism was, Hey dude, you're just like a boring white guy. Why the fuck would we pick up your documentary? And that, I mean, that's not very nice, but I think that's a little bit different than the thing he's describing. He's yeah, but right wingers have this way of like considering literally anything that goes wrong for them. They are being victimized. And I mean, not literally not anything. Not they can stub their toe and they're being victimized by a big coffee table. Not for nothing, like the biggest documentaries on the BBC every year are put out uh, or executive produced or uh, created by uh, white guys. Uh, like Attenborough. No. Uh, what's that other guy's name that did my Scientology movie? I forget his name. Um, but like these are, they're all, they're all like white guys who are maybe 10 years older than him. Uh, you're going to be, or Attenborough's a lot off older screen than him. And we'll get somebody who's a minority on instead. Well, I had about seven years of everyone saying, do not talk about this. Don't mention it. Well, that's a very lonely feeling. And whenever I did say to someone, they were always like, well, didn't that happen? And you're like, I've just had a hundred. Yeah, that's, that's, that. he's like, I did say this. And people were like, is that what happened? <laughs> people were skeptical. People were like, I don't believe you. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, but like, I don't think that I'm lying because I've convinced myself that it's true. Face that. <laughs> so it felt like that was happening again. But rather than because of my skin color, this time because of my beliefs, which is slightly less insidious. A private company has the right to say, hey, we don't want this guy at our, at our festival. I just think that the problem here is that I hold a belief that the vast majority of humans. Wait, the world he's saying a private company has a right to say, I don't want this guy at our, our festival. Does that, is that implying that a company like BBC that gets public funding is they don't have the right to say that they don't want this guy making a documentary for them. I'm not sure that he's saying that, but I don't know. I'm not saying he's saying it, but isn't that the implication? Well, the, I'm, I'm just telling you like the BBC is like any other major television network where they, they must be turning down hundreds of things for everything they pick up, possibly thousands, yeah. right? Yeah. And as I think I was saying before, until we start to speak up about this, until we make them realize that the consequences are worse for canceling people, because that's all they care about. They just care about, am I going to get a bad rap? Are people going to stop coming to my festival? So we need to show them, actually, it's even worse. Unfortunately, you're in a difficult position in festivals. But what was the uh, attendance like at the festival that you didn't speak at? It's even worse <laughs> if you cancel us. Probably at least okay. some of them feel like I have a moral duty to not platform a transphobe. And, he's made oh, and I feel like these people always downplay that, you know, they, they view everyone on, on the left as like, oh, they're only doing it to be popular. And it's like, no, actually a lot of people on the left are doing it because it's the morally right thing to do. Right. They don't, they don't, they don't, it's not even maybe that they have a moral obligation that's, it could be more that they personally just don't want to be associated with that shit. Right? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, they weren't the most supportive, were they? Um, they, they, I don't think they were too, I don't think they were too bad. I don't, um, did I say that they were really bad? No, 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 no Francis just wanted you to say <laughs> that. Like, Slam the pub and said, go on. They were, they were fine. They, yeah. they were fine. They, they are That's so, British for no. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they are so ideologically captured. Going back to that cultish yeah. aspect. These are not people who go home and, and bow down to Tom Cruise every day and mm -hmm. say, I love you and see him in a dream or whatever. Uh, but they are people who are so far gone that firstly, they can't even imagine that people like us might have reasonable arguments to make, right? I'm sure you've come up against that a million times. Uh, that uh, Brianna Joy, is that her name? Boy? Joy Gray. Yeah. yeah. Joy Gray, for, for example. Like she, she went into that not even imagining you might have been quite smart and have better ideas than her because the other side is the, as they say in Scientology, the suppressive person. So these guys are so far Wait, gone. Wait, oh, right? now, yeah, this is, that'll, this, <clears throat> this guy does this all the time. He like sort of compares um, groups of people that disagree with him to Scientology, but Scientology, they don't, it's not, I mean, it's, 
it's 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 so very different than just i think your views are abhorrent like scientology is like a top down control and demand group mm-hmm. this isn't like just some group of people that doesn't like you one example I wrote about in my Substack piece yesterday was I was at one of these events. I was with a guy who's one of the editors at one of the publishers, so I don't want to sort of, you know. But And this and the, the funny thing is this this won't even necessarily show who he is, but he's somebody from minority who also represents as queer or says they are queer. Uh, and they were speaking to... They, you asked, say? Eavesdropping. They were speaking to a woman who is a body positive, extremely overweight, autistic mixed race pro track there's like 50 of these that i could go on and on but it was just one of those people who i think is quite a difficult person as well as you can really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting there having this conversation where the editor's saying uh god i don't know if he caught that but like he he described this person with a lot of adjectives and he he goes i could go on and on basically just listing all of the things that he finds offensive about their personality or their you know beliefs or about who they are. Then he said, it's and one of those people. He, he is the one who, who feels canceled right now. Yeah. And Just, like, like, I, like I said a second ago, he was like, you know, one of those people. Yeah. Is, he is the one who feels canceled. Trans people for business or something, business advice for trans people. I don't know what. And it's so annoying because the marketing people, they, they said they, they did the research and nobody wanted to buy that book, <laughs> obviously. Like, obviously, who wants to buy business for trans? Why would it be different for a trans person? Just do business, sell an idea. Um, but it wasn't good for anyone. And they were going on about, oh, what a shame, isn't it? Because sad? it is different for a trans person. Like, business is different no matter who you are. And some identities make business more difficult. Right, just you know, trying to run a business as a black person in America is more difficult than trying to run a business as a white person. Right, just trying like, to navigate. It people. sucks. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. Right, just trying to navigate people's preconceived ideas about you. Maybe that you just might not be good at business because of this, that, or the other thing about you. Because they've decided that's the only thing about you, or or something like that. Yeah. But yep. Anyway. And all I could think was, you've been given this prestigious title where you are the gatekeeper at one of these century-old publishing houses mm -hmm. that have thousands of people in your employ, thousands of people relying on wages and things like that, and you've been told this book will not sell, but you are so ideologically captured that you believe it is good somehow, virtuous, righteous, to make a book that no one's going to read, providing it tells the readers, the, the paupers, that this is what we should all be reading about trans business. I mean, it's insane, isn't it? When people I what his book sales numbers are like. arguing about taking a decision and making a product that has no commercial value to it whatsoever. I mean, that is the antithesis of what companies should be doing. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's baked into this is that this person maybe who runs this publishing house somehow just doesn't even know what the fuck they're doing. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like baked into this that, the, the, that they made the decision on their own because they have some this ideological position and that they don't know what they're doing and that they, they don't know how to make any money or something, which is a little bit weird because the publishing house would eventually go under if they're the, the people managing the publishing house didn't know how to find and publish books that people want to purchase. The, 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 it's harder and harder, actually, to run a publishing house these days. It also denigrates what good business people do and good creatives do. Because really good creative people, I think it's, it's, a, it's an art, of course, to be a creative person. Mm -hmm. But the real art is in being creative in a way that society uh, can profit from it. Can, you know, it's, it's all well and good being the best tiddlywinks player in the world, right? But you're probably not going to make good money from it. And for good reason, it doesn't really serve society. So by all means, be a great writer who wants to write about trans business, but unfortunately no one wants it. So if you're a real genius, if you're really successful, or want to be but like, you can make a lot of money playing other things that don't serve society, quote unquote. It's just that it's not popular. And like, like tiddlywinks isn't a professional sport. And like, we also don't know if the book he's talking about was published. We don't know if it's sold well. We don't know. We have no like information, right? About like, is this, is this a how to book? Is it more like a memoir? Like of the story mm -hmm. of, of a person, a trans person who did business and they're hoping that you could learn from their experience. We don't know anything about the book. We just know that apparently it was one, one of those kinds of people, whatever the fuck that means <laughs> and that, 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 uh, that I guess the the person who runs whatever publishing house he's talking about but not mentioning must be a fucking idiot. That's that's what I'm getting from this.
did a people. I would argue that what this guy does, what Andrew Gold does, is worthless to society. Right. And, and I'm not, he makes money doing it. I'm not. Yeah. And I just don't know how well his book's going to do. And that's the nub of it, because if you look at companies like Disney, they're doing exactly the same thing. Oh, yeah. Famous for not being able to make any fucking money, Disney. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're real struggling right now. <laughs> they are. They're down to five uh, money printing machines when they used to have six. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're only bringing in tens of billions instead of the hundreds of billions that they were bringing in. That's probably not true. They're probably making more a, money a now. A few months ago. <laughs> probably making more money now than ever because of Disney Plus. Yeah, they probably are. <laughs> yep. Different type of... Like, literally, they own everything. They own Star Wars. They own Marvel. They own, uh, obviously, all the Disney properties that they originally owned. They own so many uh, Disney properties that they just discontinue some of them, not because they're not selling, just to be like, ah, we'll build up some more. We'll build up some more uh, desire for this one and put it back out as a special edition in 10 years to make everybody fucking buy it again. Yep. A huge loss year after year after year. And you're watching this and you're going, this can't carry on. There has to be a point where they're faced with either bankruptcy or change the business model. Mm, you would like to think so. I mean, so they were just a moment ago, and we don't have the name of the publishing house, but they're talking about one of these legacy, very successful publishing houses. And now nobody here even knows what publishing house they're talking about. But I guess whatever publishing house would do the thing that either did or didn't happen that Andrew is describing is now like not profitable. None of this. There's no facts here, right? There's no, there's <laughs> nothing to like hold on to in the story. That, that is, that Disney example is a macrocosm of what I saw in the publishing world in that conversation. So we know that. We know there are people at the top at Disney who are probably scared to say things. And there are other people who are going, this is my idea. This is what they should want mm. because my son is trans or, or, or whatever. Don't put that in the trailer. My son is trans. Is <laughs> I don't have a son. That's a great title. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Andrew reveals son is trans. <laughs> Disowned the son. <laughs> what? Elon Musk's kid's trans, isn't it? But I mean, then you, you do get a lot of these, and I'm not entirely sure about this. You might have to check it after, but David Tennant, for example, a famous actor in the UK, uh, he's, he's come out as very pro the whole mm. ideology. And I think he has a, 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 a trans child or someone in the family and unfortunately those are people who are just uh beholden to to the that guy play doctor who isn't he like one of the most famous fucking actors in the world yep yeah <laughs> he's <a> fucking idiot <laughs> so they're wait is he about to say beholden to the ideology is that what he's gonna say yeah it couldn't just be that couldn't just be that this uh this guy david Tennant, who played doctor who is like oh um, maybe we should be cool to these people actually Right. <laughs> Doesn't have any agency of his own. Couldn't be empathy. <laughs> it it must be that they're beholden to the ideology by having a close relative who's trans. D don't pay no mind to all the people who have close relatives that are trans that a are absolutely despicable shit monsters that just like crap all over their trans relatives. And not for nothing, he's like, uh, we can check on this later. I don't even know if this is true, but maybe he's got a son who's trans or a relative who's just like, <laughs> dude, like what, why are you even bringing, why are you even bringing him up, dude? <laughs> you fucking leave Doctor Who alone, man. I'm not even a Doctor Who fan, but fucking leave Doctor Who alone. Fuck, dude, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Adds ideologies of their offspring. Mm. So y you didn't, see, because I think the, um, this isn't to like second guess your decisions, but quite often in the situation that you find yourself in, actually the smart thing is to say something, is to go, look, this is what people are doing. But you were, you kept being told, don't say anything, don't say anything. And ultimately you didn't initially, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure about it. It's something I spoke with Francis about, like, look, I know this is a big deal and will get me clicks and views and things. Now that's something that the other side will hold against you. Like, oh, you want clicks and views? And it's like, this is my living and I can't make my living. I'm not gonna do a second book. Like, of course not. I'm, I'm so lucky that I managed to get that book. That book was, was done before I was even a YouTuber, didn't have a name or anything. I had to go to like 50 different literary agents and then they had to sell it to 50 or so publishers who all said no. You know, the standard story that everybody who tries to sell a book has, it's impossibly hard. And I'm very proud that I got to do it. The, I'm not, they, they, firstly, they wouldn't want me to, and I wouldn't want to do it because I'd have to deal with the sort of knowing looks and the, oh God, is he a bit controversial? These kinds of, I can imagine meetings where they would say, or, you know, not just me, but Francis and Constantine, you know, oh God, do we want to do their book? This is a bit awkward. The, the, the real hypocrisy comes obviously when like the bookshops that didn't want me to hold meetings in there. I'm sure they might have Jordan Peterson. They might have Jeremy Clarkson who punched a guy.
Like, uh, you know, I think if you're that successful. Okay, so Jordan Peterson, like, we don't like him, but he way more fucking famous than uh, Andrew Gold, dude. That's it. He way more famous. One famous, I think that's yep. when the money comes into yeah. it. That might be the case with Disney as well. I don't know if there is an idea that's slightly not woke, but they know it's going to make huge amounts of money. Maybe that will change it. I don't know. But, but you're right. I, yeah, I wasn't going to say anything at first. I wasn't sure. I was a bit scared too because what happens? Do they do they pull my book? I'm even thinking that now. Do they stop it going out in America? It goes out there in a few months. It's not even out there yet. Does something happen? I don't know. The thing is, a little bit of controversy is not going to hurt, Andrew. Yeah. As, as well. Like, no, even look at Constantine's being like, you're being kind of a weenie about this. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, that's not great. When Constantine's like, hey, man, um, I think you're being kind of a weenie about this. Uh, a little bit of controversy is actually good for your book sales. Uh, upset about something you've said and you haven't said anything actually terrible. That's not going to hurt. Uh, and I'm not as successful as Jordan Peterson or whatever, but I have no problem, neither does Francis, getting a book deal because once people are interested in what you have to say, it's kind of so that's why I think you know you're going to love my trans business book, mate. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I, I saw you being approached. I mean, look, look, when we were, we were in America, and I wondered if there's a sort of American publishers were sort of hovering around the event we were at, uh, and I wondered is is it maybe a little bit different in America? Is there slightly less fear? There is, I think, but but even in the UK, ultimately, what it's about, I think, is once you establish that people are interested in what you're doing, then at that point, money talks. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, I think it's good that you're talking about it, uh, and particularly given that the book itself isn't controversial, but it is very interesting. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, apart from the, the PDF file stuff. Why is that controversial? Surely, isn't everybody against that? <laughs> yeah. Well, ah, that's not everybody. What about what about the pro map community? That is a good way of putting. Oh, it. that's the thing that y'all have made up. That's it. That's, yep. that's the thing that y'all have made up. So, I mean, to take non oliver seriously here for a second which i shouldn't be doing but i i will uh, it's not controversial but the right has made it controversial by claiming that everyone that they hate is a pedophile right they're they pedo you know, if the you're pedo, pedo jacketing that they pedo yeah, everybody. It, if you're a democrat you must be a pedophile if you're a trans well, that, person you must hold be on, a hold pedophile on, hold on, if you're, hold on hold on that's the q people and that's always been like the satanic panic was saying that also like about people they thought were satanists and stuff this is actually nothing new it's more about like a moral panic than it is about like conservative ideology uh you know if if you save children from dying in a cave you're a pedophile well yeah that that one was that one was weird i don't know why he <laughs> called him that. it was because he didn't like his toy submarine <laughs> yeah, it's because Elon got hurt, and when when right wingers get hurt, their response is ad hominem attacks. That was a chapter that was just me going as a journalist, which is what I've always wanted to do. It's just the gonzo journalism. I mean, so many of us have other. You guys are comedians, of course. I, I spoke to Andrew Doyle about this. He wants that he was a literary reviewer. That's what he really cares about and wants to do. I think I always liked the whole Louis Theroux kind of going to meet all these weird subcultures in different parts of the world. So that book allowed me. To you are no Louis Theroux. So I was off in Germany meeting um, a, a young sort of twenty-five-year-old woman who who is attracted to children, and she said she's never offended. But people sometimes will be a bit, I mean, it's been fine actually so far, but some people might be offended and go, oh, you've platformed this woman who you've made anonymous. And I've never said, oh, so she should, I said she's, she's good because she is withholding from doing that deed. Here's a question. Yeah. <laughs> when you were putting I'm up- I'm worried by the way, yeah, just so yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm tense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go, go on, mate. Go on. Let it go. Here we go. So. When you were putting out all of that, all of the, you know, the, the trans stuff, trans women aren't women, we really should have copyrighted that, mate. Anyway, we're going <laughs> to... Well, I mean, Kelly yeah. J. Keen was the one that said it. Yeah, we exactly. Just, we just sat there and shat ourselves on camera <laughs> as yeah. she was saying it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Um, let's be honest, you knew you were treading the line. Mm -hmm. Did you not think, hang on a second, this could be... Because I certainly felt that way. And yeah. I know Constantine did as well, when we were especially the spiciest stuff. Nah, that Balls of steel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you've got each other. Some of us are out here on our own, but, but you know, and, and that must help sometimes, right? You've got yeah. each other, you're like, hey, yeah. let's go for yeah. it. I mean, I, my previous channel, which I was, that's what I was doing until six months ago when I started Heretics, it was- It is very cute that Constantine and Francis have each other. 
society. And that's what really interests me. I love thinking about how humans get moved one way or another, mm. the banality of evil, how it might happen to me, where I might be doing it. I love that. And so I did so much stuff on, obviously, the Scientology and Nixium and all that stuff. But Oh, yeah, but uh, he did a lot of stuff. He interviewed a lot of uh, ex-Scientologists who are in my in my circle. You know, they're... Uh, and now most of those people fucking hate him. <laughs> I can't fucking tell you how many of the people that have been on his show that have, I've talked to about something else. And he came up and they're like, oh, God, I'm fucking I feel really dumb for going on this guy's show. Like, I can't tell you how many fucking people. Every now and then, and I did Hasidic Jews, of course, as well. Every now and then I did one on, say, Islam. Or I did one on, um, on on trans, which I just felt obviously still have these cultish elements. And firstly, they didn't do very well compared to the others. I mean, the Hasidic Jew stuff was hundreds of thousands of views. Everyone was really interested in it. Everyone was criticizing, oh, God, there's this community where there... And there are things to criticize about the Hasidic Jewish community. Um, Islam didn't get many views. And the comments were just, oh, well, you're a racist. <laughs> you're, just a, you're just a racist then. Well, what was trans the content? You're a transphobe. Suddenly there's like Reddit, subreddits about me being the transphobe. Everybody's putting in their two pence about me being a transphobe. And I just thought being a contrarian, which I think all of us must be, and, and all our viewers must I be. I mean, literally, he is a trans. Does he disagree with that? And there aren't whole, like, there aren't whole subreddits. There, he, there's, I think there's one subreddit about him, and it's mostly his fans. He comes up in other subreddits, like the Decoding the Guru subreddit. He comes in up uh, and every now and again in r slash Scientology. And um, yeah, he, he comes up in places, but there aren't like whole subreddits dedicated to the fact that he's kind of a bigot. He's wrong. But like, does he disagree that he's a transphobe? I, you'd have to ask him, but he probably would never talk to you. He called me a stalker. Because that I don't understand. Like, if someone is transphobic or homophobic, like, they have to know that, right? Like, that they fit the definition of the word. This guy hates trans people. Like, he, he dislikes trans people. That's the definition of the or, word transphobe. Like, or he doesn't if you, care. If you are that, if you do that, you are a transphobe, period. Or he doesn't. Or. Uh, my turn uh, or he doesn't care that much but he's willing to monetize the the, the other people's uh, other people's bigotries and biases which is the it's you, you, there's no way to know the difference right this, this kind of content it's like you've got that itch now you're like well if those are the two things that i can't mm. talk about mm. the two cultish things i'm you know and i'm writing about suppression and authoritarianism then i'm making a new channel and that's what i want to talk about because I don't have any friends who are right wing. I don't have. I don't know anyone who is a student studying English literature with me who is some like right wing Nazi and believes that people of different races are uh, less important than other people or whatever it might be. I have loads of friends who are woke who sign up to these things unthinkingly. That will change, mate. <laughs> there, there are lots of friends. It has who are woke. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your friends are like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. What the fuck? to change yeah from from this but that's what that's what it was you're right i knew it did he did constantine say to him that the fact that he has lots of friends will change it's i think he just no, said, he said that he said the fact that he has lots of friends who he considers woke will change okay okay i mean i think the fact that he has lots of friends will change we'll see you know the more he pursues this path the fewer friends he'll have period until he has none really hurt and you feel misrepresented and misunderstood but you also feel like it's too important not to do it mm -hmm. and maybe he'll be the first to achieve negative friends I've, i'm really enjoying heretics by the way you're doing oh, a great you. job mm -hmm. with you and winston marshall have both really taken off in the last few months and it's great oh, to see trigonometry blueprints well winston and i no, look, we did we do and winston and i speak about that we're like you know thank fuck for trigonometry. I thought, can I say fuck on trigonometry? I thought, yes, I can. Yeah, I think you yeah. can. Uh, but look, everybody's got a, uh, like the way really cool stuff happens is through inspiration. You thought, can I say fuck on trigonometry? A show named after triggering people. Can I say a bad word? So some of these uh, people's uh, like writers and instructions have been released and you might be a little bit surprised. I don't know that particularly that theirs have, but some of them say don't swear in the first five minutes, um, stuff like that.
Okay, so like they're they're okay with transphobia. They're I, okay I, with homophobia. I didn't say. I just okay said. With I mild just said. Racism. I just said that I don't know that <laughs> okay. they're. But, but maybe not the F word. <laughs> your own skill set. So you have a unique skill set, having done filmmaking and done your hmm. other channel and worked at the BBC and whatever. And Winston's got his own skill set. He's like the most well-read man you'll ever yeah. meet. Mm. If you ever go to his house, it's like covered in books and books everywhere. Yeah, so but just because there's books everywhere doesn't mean the person has read them. Their own skill set. So you take what you have and then you look at what other people are doing. You put that together and hopefully you come up with something new that didn't exist before, which is what you're doing, which is what Winston's doing, which is what we did when we started trigonometry because we looked around and we saw people in America mostly at the time doing stuff that nobody here was doing. And we were like, let's do that with our own twist. So that's how it works. And it's beautiful that you guys are crushing it. But what I was going to ask you was one of the things you really have honed in on um, is Islam. And you mm. mentioned you had concerns about it. And I think post October 7th, with what we've been seeing on the streets of major Western cities, that conversation has come to the fore and people are, you know, talking about the ideology, the fact that Islam isn't just a religion, there's also a political dimension to it and all of that is, that was a conversation that was being had by people like Douglas Murray and others a while back. It's really come back and you're one of the people who's keen to talk about it. Tell us more about why you're interested in it and what are some of the concerns you have. I think it's just another place where people unthinkingly, maybe they react emotionally and they see pictures of what's happening in Gaza, mm. which of course is terrible and, and so horrible to watch. And I feel terribly for those people. Um, it's it's almost as if the world is split into two groups of people. And one group is, is that group of acting emotionally and acting uh, like they would like the world to be. Uh, mm. As Bertrand Russell, would, it's one of my favorite quotes, but I, I, it's too much pressure to to come up with it, but it's just, you know, look at the facts. Don't don't look at how you'd like the world to be and or what you think would make the world better. And then the other half of the world looks at things and goes, okay, there's this war going on. Why? People are saying it's genocide. People are saying it's apartheid. These are thought terminating cliches in, in cult terms. These are thought that's not no 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 no. Suggesting or talking about the fact that something that, that there's an apartheid state or that there's possibly a genocide going on, those that's not should not terminate thought. At all? Why would that terminate your your thought about the subject? Like, stop terminating cliches or like it is what it is. And you're trying to you're like basically you're like stop complaining about this, right? <laughs> like that's what that's yep. what it, like thought terminating cliches are those things. Terminating cliches. That's such a great line. Yeah, mm, yeah. But that it's that's just such a good. Oh, that's that's fucking I, brilliant. Nobody's ever said that before. That's what I've been thinking about a lot because people keep using phrases of that kind. And I'm going like, it doesn't, those words don't mean what you think they mean. Mm -hmm. And they don't map onto the reality of anything that's going on. No. But, but they are very powerful mm -hmm. at getting people to just, they like, certainly do though. Like if, if Israel is trying to destroy an entire people and the definition of genocide is destroying an entire people, then Israel is is trying to commit genocide, right? And the other thing, like what Constantine, and he does this a lot. He makes like declaratory statements about the state of the world, but as if they are uh, facts, but they're in, in fact just his opinion. And like yeah. we all do that sometimes, like whatever, that's fine. But like if he he's he has every right to have the opinion that that what's going on in Gaza doesn't meet the standard for genocide. I happen to disagree. But like that doesn't make me wrong and him right. Do you know what I'm saying? Nor does it make me right and him wrong. Actually, we we would have to like look into what's going on and compare it to other things that, in hindsight, we have called uh, genocide. And that would be not my job. I'm just a I'm just a, a troll and a talk show host. But according to Andrew Gold, we can't do that because you've terminated all thought by using the word genocide. Yeah, yeah, which he doesn't know what a thought terminating cliche is, obviously. <laughs> that's it. And, and thought terminating cliche, that's a great, I'll, yeah. I'll keep that yeah. in mind. Yeah. Even I'll keep that in mind. What, have you never heard that shit before, Constantine? <laughs> Did you just learn that shit? Apparently not. <laughs> if you're in a relationship, it's something I had to learn, I think, in my own sort of personal relationships, not to say to people, you are a person who does this, or that is you, because then people can't come back from that, and it's not in, in, uh, conducive to a, a, a helpful conversation. Uh, apartheid. And if, look, if, if your ideology falls apart after one line of questioning, then it's on shaky ground. 
If your ideology falls apart when you say, okay, oh, this, this guy's a woman, well, that's quite an extraordinary claim. What's mm. the extraordinary evidence? Give, why is, what is a woman? Nothing. Mm. They can't, mm. that, oh, Justin Freakin's definition. A woman is, and this isn't perfect, but it's pretty fucking good. A woman is a, a, woman is a uh, person who identifies as a woman who will tend to exhibit mostly feminine features. Yep. I mean, I could come up with a bunch of definitions of woman that fit a trans woman. And this guy can maybe come up with a handful that don't, but all of the ones that this guy can come up with, for sure, 100%. Don't include people that he would consider a woman. So, you know, I, I just, I don't believe that anyone who ever asks the question, what is a woman has honestly ever actually thought about it. Right. They just think they, in fact, <clears throat> they may be trying to use it as a thought terminating cliche, right? Yep. <laughs> they may be trying to do that. Shocking yep. because we, we are people who value critical thinking. So you think, well, these have, they have such strong beliefs. They must have something tangible. And they don't. And so apartheid, and you go, interesting. Because it just I, means I, apartness. And I, I, I've been to Israel a whole bunch of times. And uh, we used to go fairly often. And one thing I did not see was one race lording it over all the others. It's, it was absurd to me. Israel did you go to Gaza? It does a better job of it than many other countries. The idea it is apartheid is insane. Some people then know a little bit more and will say, oh, but what's happening in Gaza and all that? That's where the apartheid is. Well, it doesn't make Israel an apartheid state. It makes Israel a country at war. And these are, are very difficult for, I guess, people who are... In no, it literally just means apartness. And there is an apartness there where the Palestinians are apart from the rest yep. of the state of Israel and it is imposed by the government. Therefore, it is an apartheid state. That's it. Yep. it this is not fucking complicated. You don't have to think about it very much. It's a cultish ideo the ideology to understand, and I don't think they want to understand. I'm starting to think, and I know this is going to come as a shock to you, Dave, but I'm starting to think that Andrew Gold is a fucking moron. Yeah, and <clears throat> it's either either that or or he's uh, smart and knows exactly like what like the sort of audience that he's cultivating wants. But maybe, but I'd I'd probably put it at like ninety ten that he's just a fucking moron. So much negativity and bad stuff has come from the whole war situation. Yeah. One thing I've noticed is that Jews have left wokeism. Jews have a long history of being on the left, of course, and sometimes in communism, Marxism, and, and wokeism. Obviously, any race, ethnicity, culture, you have a huge divide of people. Everyone's very different. But I've seen so many people I know, Jewish people I know, who were woke and who disagreed with me on everything to do with trans and this and that, who at universities, if they work there or they work in academia, wherever it is, for the first time are starting to go, oh, you know what, maybe. And if, that, if that's not right, what else is not right in this? We know from all sorts of studies that this is like a self-selecting group of people who still talk to him on beliefs in the pursuit of accuracy. We think we do. We think we form a belief. But he knows so many. We won't tell you the number or their names around us. And we want to fit in. It makes sense. They go to Canada. You wouldn't know. Perspective. Um, I mean, they go to school in Canada as <laughs> well. Like, you know, you might hope someone like your friend or your son is going to stop in the trans thing or whatever. They never do. They almost never leave cults just of their own accord or because they've heard better information. The only way that they leave cults is if they're treated so badly in their own cult. So we are seeing that. I've seen it countless times as Scientologists who said, like, nothing would have convinced them. You say, but Lord Zenu is not a real thing. They're like, yes, he is. Tom Cruise isn't mm. going to come and fuck you. Yes, he is. Whatever they believe. Um, um, Scientology isn't when you believe Tom Cruise is going to have sex with you. <laughs> I have some wacky beliefs, but not that wacky. The Jews in places that are particularly woke are suddenly coming into university or wherever it is and going like, oh, these people are all saying that what happened to my second cousin was an act of freedom and liberty when my second cousin was raped or whatever. Uh, and they're going, oh, this is me being treated really, really badly by my own people. Those people, it takes a few months, takes six months, maybe you speak to them again and they're like, a they're a little bit more open about, oh, maybe the trans stuff is also a bit cultish, maybe some of the other things. So, Does anyone say that being raped is an act of freedom yeah this is this is weird this is weird because <clears throat> i mean he's referring back to october 7th clearly right he's referring back okay. to the, 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 the attack the hamas attack of october 7th i but, don't think that anyone calls that an act of freedom no no 
I think you'd have to look pretty hard to find uh, somebody who's like, oh, that was a good idea. That was a great thing. Glad that happened. You'd have to look pretty hard to find somebody. Now, the, yep. the, <clears throat> that's different than being like, well, I can understand why a paramilitary group in Gaza would form and attack the nation state of Israel. That's a lot different than saying, saying like, well, that was, that was great. Good for you. Right? Like those are two completely different statements. The way I see it is I would call it foreseeable. Like, I don't understand it. I don't condone it, but it is foreseeable. Yeah. If you, if you, terrorize a group of people for decades they grow up under your oppression then yeah they will strike back in acts of terror that's foreseeable that's predictable right the blowback yeah it's not good it's absolutely not good it's terrible but it is predictable adjacent people have started to move away from wokeness mm. So come back to your concerns. You mentioned you had concerns about Islam. Mm -hmm. Just flesh that out for us. Because I know you had, uh, we had Yasmin Mohammed on the show a mm -hmm. while back. You've had her on recently. She's very, very good at talking about her own story, but also some of her concerns. So talk to us about that. GD5 shoes are the ab absolute best. A lot deserve you for rolling. But what I use are colors for. Is, is one of the greatest speakers in the world, I think. And I, I just, I'm just amazed by her more as much as anyone else, as much as Douglas Murray, as much as any of these people, she is just absolutely brilliant, passionate and, and angry. We did a thing on, on Peter Boghossian's, you know, street epistemology. Mm -hmm. So well, could you be friends with somebody who is a Muslim? And I stood in the middle because I think, well, I'd like to think I could be friends. And she said, no, absolutely. And Peter asked our reasons and if we'd like, like to move afterwards. And Yasmin- I would just stand on yes. Yeah, why why'd you stand in the middle even? I feel like you're at least a little bigoted if you stand in the middle. Like if you're questioning whether you could be friends with a Muslim, you're yeah, you're a bigot. Right. Like I just don't even I don't know, like most people in in their friendships, especially like no, most people in their friendships unless you're like church friends or whatever, right? Like religion doesn't even come up that much. Yeah. Like, I know people who I don't know if they're religious or not, and I've known them for years, and it never fucking occurred to me to ask. Uh, those are people I met after I was a shitty atheist. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I would say most people I know, I don't know what their religion is or whether they have one. That's fine. Maybe it's not important. Yep. Because that person wants me dead. And I was like, well, like, okay, I guess I should shuffle up to more, towards Yasmin. Wait, okay, so he says... Yasmin dead. He says that he's questioning whether he could be friends with a Muslim because he doesn't know whether they want him dead. Here, we'll, we'll listen again. Middle, because I think, well, I'd like to think I could be friends. And she said, no, absolutely. And Peter asked our reasons and if we'd like, like to move afterwards. And Yasmin's reason was because that person wants me dead. And oh, okay, I, the I, other person. Okay, I guess I should shuffle up to more, towards Yasmin because I don't want to be friends with someone who wants Yasmin dead. And... That is the issue currently with Islam. It's something that Dawkins said, of course, at the event. We were out talking with Ayan Hirsi Ali that look, all the religions have stuff that we may or may not agree with, but Islam seems to be stuck, or at least its adherents, its believers seem to be stuck 700 years in the past. What do you do with that? And what do you do with a, a nation's social cohesion when you have a huge influx of people with very different beliefs from, from your own? Mm -hmm. How do we make that work? This is absolutely terrifying. But why would you assume because someone is Muslim that they want you dead? It's it's so crazy too because like by their logic it would just be like constant conflict, right? Like in countries where Muslim people immigrate and in communities where Muslim people live, they would be in constant conflict with everyone else who lives there and that doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> yeah. Like just because it's written in in their their holy text that like you know these are the rules you must follow and if you don't follow them you know you deserve death or whatever like that's written in every well not every religion but a lot of religions certainly Christianity I've read a lot of the Bible there's a lot of rules in there where if you don't follow that rule the the punishment is death and I mean not for nothing I read in the uh, super woke lefty publication uh, Reason. Uh, right before gay marriage was passed, that uh, Muslims were in favor of gay marriage uh, much more than uh, evangelical Christians in this country. So, like, all this stuff kind of falls <laughs> apart because it seems like, um, like, they just 
people, when they move somewhere, they just become a part of the culture where they move. It's sort of what we do as human beings. Yep. I can't stress that enough. And we're at a point now where particularly as Jewish people, and I think that's why Jewish people really sense this, I have very real discussions with my wife about, you know, are, are, we, are we safe? And are we safe in the UK? And I tell yes. family members to, I mean, Jewish people have what, what is called a mezuzah on the door. Uh, it's sort of a bit of a script or whatever. Even I mean, most of them are not even religious. These are culturally Jewish people, but they have their little mezuzah thing and marks on the side of the door. I wouldn't have that now. We we live where we live with right right next to two mosques, and we know that there is there's all sorts of radicalization that does go on in mosques. That was 20 years ago when we knew about that. Channel Four documentaries, when Channel Four used to do real hard hitting investigations, they did all of these inf investigations into mosques and the radicalization that goes on. He's such a victim, Jesus. He's like never experienced any sort of like a, like attack based on his religion, yet he's so victimized. Just because he lives near mosques, he's so victimized that he can't even express his Jewishness. So the, 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 the crazy thing about this is I have no idea what kind of churches are around me. I just don't know. I fucking couldn't tell you. <laughs> like, it's because it's fucking I'm not. And like, he says he's an atheist, too. Basically, what kind of churches are around me falls into the category of things uh, none of my business. None of my business unless like <laughs> I'm like if somebody if I met somebody and they're like, Hey, you want to come to church with me? I'd be like, Fuck yeah, let me check out your church. <laughs> yep. Calling <laughs> for the death of Jews. So when there are people who are super woke in my comments going, Oh, you're an Islamophobe or something, I, I would say to them, Can you imagine knowing there are people calling for the death Just don't go to the Jehovah's Witness Church. That place is the opposite of fun. It's unimaginable for most people. And in the last twenty years, that's only at least the one I went to years ago. The police then were annoyed with Channel 4. There's a whole documented thing about this where the police were saying to Channel 4, like, hey, come on, you're stirring up tensions here, rather than being like, there's what? All these mosques where people are saying we must go and kill the Jews. Are you kidding? They didn't, they didn't care. The reason they don't care isn't because they're anti-Semitic. It's because they're scared. People are scared. And what do we do? I, do, I, do, I honestly don't know. I mean, what do you guys think we should do? What happens next? Oh, I think you should shut the fuck up. And I also think that we should end this uh, podcast part of the show and that we shouldn't watch the rest of this <laughs> bullshit in the red light. That's what I think. <laughs> oh, we're naked. I just put the docket up on screen. That's what I think. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm down with that. <laughs> like, that, that was... Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> I don't think there are groups of people going around to check what kind of iconography is on anyone's front door. I mean, there, yeah, like like you tell me a lot. There might be someone in the world somewhere, but yeah, it's not a prevalent thing, <laughs> right? <There's, laughs> and <clears throat> the other thing is, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know like super a, a lot of Jewish people, but I have Jewish, I have Jewish friends, and there's, I don't, I've, when I go to their homes, I don't see a lot of religious icon iconography they're not catholics for fuck's sake they don't you know what i'm saying they don't have fucking iconography all over their damn house like, <laughs> it's not like a goddamn jesus and oh they they, they actually uh, they don't believe he was the messiah but you know what i'm saying like there's i just most like and most religious people generally just don't have a lot of iconography around their house because like they maybe appreciate other kinds of paintings artwork other kinds of things in the world so if they have a mm -hmm. sign on their door, there's, it's like no soliciting except the tamale lady. You cool. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> like that's like most people don't have that stuff, but you have every right to. And I don't think that you should be unsafe as a result, obviously, but I also don't think that it makes you unsafe. I think this is yeah. like all this, this is like way overblown <clears throat> and <clears throat> If there are, like, I don't know what the laws are in, in uh, the UK, uh, here in the US, actually, that's for your, that's for your pr protected under the First Amendment, as long as you're not, like, straight up calling for violence. And I don't know what the laws are in the UK, but, like, if, if that's what people want to say at their, at their wor place of worship, I don't know. I think they're probably going to alienate more people than they're going to get. By doing that, I, I don't think that <clears throat> I don't think that most people of any faith are like going to go to a church that's like, oh, oh, you should fucking you should eat everybody who doesn't, or you should eat this other group of people. Most people are going to go to that church and go, oh, yikes, uh, we should find another church. <laughs> like, yep. And and also like, 
when there are attacks like hate crime attacks on uh someone for a, a specific you know reason because they're either some particular religion or some political affiliation like that kind of stuff makes national news because it's so rare at least in the u.s it's like you know when there's that kind of attack when someone is is killed for a reason like that it's in a country of like 330 million people it makes national news right and not for not for nothing here in the here in the u.s and i don't know about the uk but here in the u.s when that happens it ain't usually a muslim doing it when it, if they're doing if they're going after yep. jewish people usually a fucking neo-nazi yep well i don't know that's the show uh do you want to i don't know do you want to do read out the show there ain't nothing there ain't nothing fun in red light but at least it's not going to be a moment more of that so uh <laughs> yeah you want to read out the show go right ahead yep all right thank you for checking out the intellectual dollar tree we do this show every wednesday at 7 p.m pacific right here on twitch.tv slash echoplex media if you're listening live then stick around after the the song for red light and if you're listening on the podcast maybe check us out live you can see what we do for red light we change the color of the lights and the contents of our drinks and we have fun uh if you want to support us you can do that at patreon.com echoplex or eplex.store and now here is boomers by periscope